Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 216, recorded on November 21st, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. This week, we wanted to start with a story you may have seen passed around online, with a headline stating that a serious security problem exists in Linux that enables DNS cache poisoning. It really all started back in 2008 when Dan Kamsky demonstrated a method to attack DNS infrastructure and change the results for a particular DNS lookup. So first, the attacker masquerades as an authoritative DNS server. That's the server that's responsible for a particular domain, the one that they want to attack. Say, tuxies.party. They then flood a DNS resolver, like maybe Cloudflare's public 1.1.1.1 service. They give that service, they just flood it with fake lookup results that have a different destination IP than the actual legitimate destination. Then any client using the server for their lookups in the future would receive this bogus result. Worse, they wouldn't get their vote in over at Tuxius.party. The core of the issue here comes down to the fact that DNS uses a 16-bit transaction ID in an attempt to stop this kind of thing, but unfortunately, 16 bits... It's just not that big. It's easily brute forceable and predictable because there's only about 65,000 possible transaction IDs. Yeah, maybe that was a lot back in the day, but (laughs) now here we are in 2021. That's pretty easy to calculate. Now, it's not all that easy for it actually to work. The attacker has to slam the DNS server that's being attacked with these bogus lookup results with predicted transaction IDs in there and then the fake IP address. But they have to hope that their forged response arrives before the reply from the real authoritative DNS server. So it's basically like, hey, I'm the resolver, I'm Cloudflare, I go out and ask whoever's hosting tuxies.party, what's the IP address? And then the person attacking sends their fake response in with the guest transaction ID and hopes that I receive it first because this is UDP here, I have no other way of knowing besides that transaction ID if this is the real response or not. Yeah, okay, so this has all been figured out since 2008. What we're talking about here isn't necessarily new. And we came up with ways to solve this problem, essentially, or so we thought. Essentially, this was solved by reconfiguring DNS servers to send their responses back on ephemeral port instead of reusing port 53. So the attacker is not only then forced to guess the transaction ID, but now they also have to figure out the reply port being used. And for a while, that worked. But unfortunately, new research shows there are unexpected ways an attacker could determine that ephemeral reply port. A team at the University of California at Riverside, building on research conducted last year, found a new side-channel attack that does just that. Writing, quote, We find that the handling of ICMP messages in the Linux kernel uses shared resources in a predictable manner, such that it can be leveraged as a side-channel. This allows an attacker to infer the ephemeral port number of a DNS query and ultimately lead to DNS cache poisoning attacks. Yeah, okay, so think of this side-channel attack as a type of ICMP port scanning, where the attackers are sending spoofed ICMP packets in attempt to determine the ephemeral UDP port that is being used for those DNS lookup replies. The problem is these ICMP packets are used for network diagnostics, at least most commonly. Uh, And by design, that means they don't necessarily receive a reply. However, that didn't stop these researchers because they observed that even though they don't get a reply, they're still changing some internal data structures in the kernel. Then they thought to themselves, well, if we can just expose that data structure some other way, we can still determine what that reply port is. They managed to do this, and it starts with the attacker pinging the DNS server under attack, while at the same time sending some spoofed ICMP requests that ask that DNS server to change its packet fragmentation size. In those spoofed ICMP requests, the attackers have to guess that ephemeral port number. And if they guess it right, they'll observe that the fragmentation on the replies to their pings has actually changed. That's the signal they've managed to guess the right port. And now, with that port in hand, they just have to simply brute force that 16-bit transaction ID. And they're back to the good old DNS cache poisoning attack from 2008. Yeah, really, they just had to solve for that ephemeral port problem. Once they had that figured out, the original attack works. Now, this vulnerability affects DNS software running on Linux, including Bind, Unbound, and DNS Mask. It does not seem to impact FreeBSD, macOS, or Windows. And the researchers have proposed several defenses to fix the issue on Linux. One is just setting Linux to ignore ICMP messages. That effectively closes the side channel, but obviously has downsides. Another proposed defense is randomizing the cache structure to make the side channel unusable. And then a third is reject ICMP redirects. 
And of course, DNSSEC can be a mitigation of this attack, but requires the size you're using it support it, which it appears about 1.8% of the top 10,000 Alexa websites actually support DNSSEC. So DNSSEC might not actually be an option for most of us. And really right now, this is in the research phase. As far as we know, we haven't seen much of this in the wild, but we'll keep an eye on that. And if mitigation ship, we'll keep an eye on that and let you know. Some distributions are known for their documentation, like Arch and their famous wiki. But it seems now Canonical will be investing in a new, comprehensive, long-term project to transform their documentation. Daniela Prachita, the recent director of engineering at the Ubuntu Maker, laid out plans to dramatically improve their documentation efforts moving forward, writing on their blog, quote, Our aim is to create and maintain technical documentation and documentation practices that will represent a standard of excellence in the industry. He goes on to say, we want it to be the best it possibly can be. By best, we mean documentation that above all else understands, respects, and reflects and serves its users' needs. And Uncle really is emphasizing that this is a company-wide effort, not just limited to engineering. Writing on their blog, quote, This is a permanent, ongoing commitment. It's work that will never end, and it's already started, and will become part of the fundamental canonical discipline of making software. We'll have their entire blog post linked in the notes. After a rather public failure during a recent YouTuber Linux switch challenge, a new version of the apt package manager, version 2.312, has been released. This update includes a fix for that recent famous apt scenario. Yeah, this change changes the way apt handles a conflict resolution situation. Instead of warning the user and prompting them to proceed with apt's suggested fix, which, as we see, doesn't always work out so well, apt will now just error out, providing no suggestion and deferring the critical conflict resolutions to the user explicitly. Right, so the change here is going from asking the user if they're super sure they want to proceed with a risky change to now telling them there's a problem, and then leaving it to them to solve it manually. System76 had actually started working to solve this in Pop! OS directly, but has already prepared to bring these new upstream changes in. The Plasma Software Discover app is also being updated. Discover now has a new way to ensure you keep a working system, with an updated mechanism to detect important packages getting removed and give you a friendly warning. That's a good change for Discover to make. That's the kind of tool new users should be using to manage their software. And something else Discover is doing is they're hiding some of the technical jargon behind a button. So you're going to get that friendly warning. But then there will be a button with technical details you can press to actually tell you what's going on. That really feels like a sweet spot. And I have seen some complaints online that, you know, a power tool is being made less powerful for new users that probably shouldn't be using it. And it's a loss. I don't know. You know, it... When you take all of this in, this seems like a pretty balanced change. I mean, you can still manually resolve these issues if you're a power user and you know what you're doing. And while Linus Sebastian did ignore a warning in the GUI, and then he later ignored a warning in the terminal, he'd really have to go out of his way to break his system with this change. That might just be the right spot of user intervention versus automatically solving problems for users. I guess we better just hope Linus doesn't find out about the RM command during this challenge. Then we might have some serious patches landing. Linux 5.16 hit RC2 today and has some significant I.O. improvements. But this week, we also got a better picture of the performance patches landing in Linux 5.17. Much of the work landing in both those kernels is the NVMe code path optimizations we told you about in Linux Action News 2.12 with four more patches landing today, bringing the total to 38. Yeah, and on the networking side, Wes, we're also seeing some improvements land in 5.17's network substack. One of the set of changes that was merged earlier this week was actually from Google, which provides a sizable gain in TCP performance in the data center. But not just that, the new patch also allows Linux's TCP code to defer SKB freeing after the socket lock is released. The existing kernel code was found to just introduce excessive latency there. And it seems after success in the TCP stack, the team's looking to fix this problem for protocols besides TCP as well. And looking at a few project updates this week, the Ubiports Foundation released Ubuntu Touch OTA 20. 
It's a maintenance update that introduces support for the notification LED and vibration indicator for incoming notifications on Halium 9 devices. And the installer has been updated for even more devices. And it also has your typical batch of features, tweaks, and bug fixes. The Ubuntu Touch OTA 20 update is rolling out right now to support devices. And you can check on your device by going to the system settings and then navigating to the update screen. FWAPD, the leading open source solution for handling firmware updates on Linux devices, has a new release, version 1.7.2. 1.7.2 adds support for handling exported MTD block devices, tweaking the compiler flags to reduce the install size by around 300 kilobits, speeding up the daemon startup by almost 40%, and a variety of other fixes. Yeah, that's nice to see. Project lead Richard Hughes also shared via Twitter that the project is still seeing pretty remarkable growth. And I hope that will encourage even more vendors to participate in the project because I know when I'm shopping for new hardware, I'm checking for LVFS compatibility. Yeah, hopefully an area we'll see improving as those numbers go up. And our last quick project update, Rocky Linux 8.5 released this week. And this latest release also catches up to Alma Linux by adding secure boot support. Both projects seem to be increasing the significance of their ARM builds with 8.5 as well. Linode.com slash LAN. Linode is how we run everything we've built in the last few years in the cloud. And like us, they love Linux. They use it every day, their environment, and their tools. So go to Linode.com slash LAN to check it out. They used that base, that love for Linux, to build everything 18 years ago. That's what got them started. And now... They are the largest independent cloud provider in the world. Linode has learned during that time that customer support is just absolutely critical. So that's why they've invested in having the best customer support in the business. I got a note from listener Kevin this week, and he said, I only have a $5 Linode, but their support was great and helpful. I've never seen such expert level customer support on any other cloud provider. This company really does what they say. No support tiers, no hands off, only highly trained technicians. It really is the best. And that's true. And on top of that, Kevin, they also have some of the best performance, 11 data centers for you to choose from, great features such as object storage, cloud firewall, and backups, and a lot more, including one-click deployments for lots of applications. So go build something. Go learn something. And try it out for yourself while supporting the show. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 and 60-day credit on a new account. And you go there to kick the tires for yourself and support this here show. That's linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Ting for making this episode possible. Linux.ting.com. If you're sick of overpaying for your cell service, go see how much you could save and get $25 off when you go to linux.ting.com. Com. Ting has great customer service, great flexible rates, and nationwide coverage on multiple networks. The key is they're an MVNO, so instead of digging holes in the ground and figuring out local jurisdiction over building towers, they focus on the customer support, the flexible plans, and they run on top of the nationwide networks that exist already. So you get access to a great mix of plans and super fast LTE and 5G data. And Ting's plans are always simple and straightforward. That's why I've been a Ting customer for eight years years. Think about that. Eight years with Ting. It's just a smarter way to do mobile, and I've appreciated that. They have plans that start around $10. My plan, I think, on average these days is about 45 bucks a month. <laughs> and, you know, it really depends on your usage. You just tune it to what works for you. If you use a lot of data, they got a plan for you. If you use very little data, and that's actually pretty easy to do these days because you can sync before you head out. When you're on Wi-Fi, you just sync your stuff down. You can save so much money, it's kind of ridiculous. And every plan gets access to Ting's award-winning customer service and the LTE and 5G networks. And it's so simple to switch to Ting. Pretty much any phone works because of their broad network support. So get started by going to linux.ting.com. Check out your current phone, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. Ting's going to send you a SIM card. You're going to pop that thing in your phone, and you're going to get activated in minutes because their dashboard is great. So go there, check them out, and see how much you could save while supporting the show. linux.ting.com. That's right. Get $25 off at linux.ting.com. And we end this week with the release of Proxmox Virtual Environment 7.1. Based on Debian 11, but using a newer Linux kernel, 5.13, QEMU 6.1, and OpenZFS 2.1. Proxmox VE brings several new functionalities and a range of improvements for management tasks in the web interface. This is also the first version with support for Windows 11 and TPM, plus an enhanced creation wizard for virtual machines and containers, as well as the ability to set backup retention policies per backup job right in the GUI. Yeah, 
And they have a new scheduler daemon in 712 that supports a more flexible schedule setup. I mean, all around, to me, this looks like a real humdinger of a release, Wes. It all just comes together in 7.1 because you get Linux 5.13, QMU 6.1, and OpenZFS 2.1. Those are all great releases on their own with fantastic features, but they all are brought under the Proxmox hood. Plus, on top of all of that, they have some nice updates to the GUI for two-factor authentication settings, as well as new container templates for Fedora, Ubuntu, Alma Linux, and Rocky Linux. Proxmox sure seems great, but it's one of those projects we don't actually have a ton of experience with. A little bit, but not a great deal. That might change, though, as we build out the new local JB infrastructure. Tune in to a future Linux Unplugged for more of that. Spoilers! <laughs> now, for those of you looking to upgrade Proxmox, well, they offer both a GUI upgrade or a command line-based upgrade path. Yeah, and they've documented that process too, Wes, so that's kind of nice. I think overall I'm just kind of looking forward to spending some more time with Proxmox soon. I also noticed when I was doing a little bit of research for this episode that they're really good about posting at least part of their feature roadmap, so you get a little hint, or at least a pretty good idea, of what's coming in future updates of Proxmox. And I, I always feel like when you're targeting the enterprise or anybody that might be in a data center type workload, whenever you can be transparent about that kind of stuff and let people plan, that always gets an A grade from me. Also, it seems like these most recent versions of Proxmox have just been getting really good, packing in some really nice features and some nice fixes. So we'll be following all of that and the whole world of open source and Linux. So be sure you go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. And take a couple of minutes and go visit tuxies.party. Help vote for the open source project of the year and more. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. Music.